I was thinking about how hard retirement is. You know, I've just um, been looking at this clock here and I've spent the last hour wondering about how I'm gonna make the day pan out. It's very hard. This is uh, a little um, patio set that Peter sandblasted for us a few years back. Just finished painting it. It's come out really nice. It's just another little place to sort of like sit down and think about things. You know, well, I feel sorry for people that have got to work. I was thinking about, you know, youngsters. They've probably got to work somewhere like Eggleston for another, what, half a century? Oh, I, I really don't know. A long time anyway. Ah, oh dear. I don't know. I think I might just have another cup of coffee and just have a little relax. It's just the hard decisions you have to make. You know, do I sit in that shed there for half an hour or do I come over here and sit in this one in the shade for half hour? It's not fair, you know, a man of my ascending years shouldn't have to make these sorts of decisions. Anyway, do have a very, very nice day. Customers and staff and all those things that I really, really miss. <laughs>
I don't know what occupation he thinks he's going to be taking, but uh, if the need comes, he's willing and ready. I should also really like to thank those people that have uh, written in and said, uh, are you all right? Uh, in fact, today, somebody, Ben Collier, rang up um, uh, Lisa and uh, it's all right, Ben, I'm not dead. I've just been rather pathetic and lazy. There is no other excuse for it. And I'd like to thank Carl and Christopher and Lauren, Lauren B, Peter, John Scott. Oh, there's just so many of you that have written emails or things. I can't mention you all, um, but there you go. Thank you very much. And I am all right, as I say, just being bone idle. Now, my old man, in his wisdom, has given me half a dozen bird feeders. These ones, I'm gonna try a couple of them down here. Apparently, the design is such that if big birds get on here, like crows and things, they, they close up. Now, I'm having to put quite a bit of force on that to pull that down, so I'm not sure if it would work. And the other thing is, there's only like two ports where the poor little buggers can get on. Like I have bird feeders with like 10 or 12 ports. And I'm not too worried about the big birds. I mean, they have to eat as well. Just because it's little doesn't mean it's any less important or just because it's maybe not as cutesy. And another thing while we're on the subject of discrimination and uh, uh, protecting people since when has it been open season on ginger people now you might not have thought about this but it's quite strange how you can refer to somebody as well oh, i think the prince harry the ginger winger they call him or ginger minger or that ginger bloke or oh strictly come dancing oh it's the ginger bloke you can't say that about a black person or a brown person it's the black one you say that, you get into trouble, bro. Yeah, you can say the ginger one. No problem at all. The other thing I once did is I, I asked a load of my staff, the female ones, would you go out with a ginger boy? And they were very, very reticent. No, 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 they were. Yeah, so uh, here's the thing to my viewers. Ask some of your female friends whether they'd be happy to go out or date if you're in America, a ginger bloke. Yeah, you just, uh, you just ask them. There is always a hesitancy. It's quite strange, really. I, I, I never had any problem getting girlfriends, but like, the thing is, well, I never actually asked one out ever, I don't think. I just sort of suggested it might be beneficial for them. Or it might not be bored. If they join me somewhere, I don't think I ever, ever asked a female out. No, I never. Anyway, that's another thing. That's another thing, but it's it's strange. It's it's that hesitancy. I don't know why it is. I never had a problem because I wasn't properly sort of ginger. I, well, bits were, but other bits like my hair on top of my head. That was like I like to call it harvest gold, but it was more blonde than ginger wasn't proper red ginger. But it's, it's an interesting thing. The, the, the whole point of this digression is that the, the, the open season, the, the, the freedom to sort of refer to people by being ginger and in a derogatory way, but you can't do it with other people because of a physical thing that they were born with. Very strange. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like you to explain to me why that is. I really, really want to know. Do I? Yeah, I do. Oi, you want to know? You're not bothered, are you? Providing you have a walk, some grub and soft bed. That should be what it's all about, really. Yeah. She's now going off thinking, silly old bastard, what's he talking about? One other lovely thing seeing uh, we're out for a little wander in the woods along the side of the Tees is to see anemone 
Nemorosa. Look at that. They're just so pretty. So lovely. There is a delicacy that in here they're amongst wild garlic, the ransoms. And uh, the the light is a bit a little bit on the weak side. But they're all the way along. Little colonies of them up here. And look there's Arums, Dog's Mercury, Anemone, Nemorosa has got to be this week in the season. It's got to be the little star of the show. Maybe not as bold and as as randy as the snowdrop, you know. But it's lovely all the same. The whole anemone family is just so lovely. Look at this along here. The snowdrop gets all its all the glory. But this, if the sun was out, it would be be decked with a million jewels. How's that for being a poetic fucker? Now, wood anemones. And we all probably know what wood anemones are. If not, I'll see if I can dig out a little picture of them. You can dig them out the ground. Um, these are stock plants. The, the normal uh, wood anemone is anemone nemorosa. There's a white form called alba. There's a nice slightly blue form called this one here. This is a, this is a, it's called, called Robinsoniana. One of my favorites, it's a really nice one. And there's a double form called Vestal, which we've always grown. The, uh, we'll just get them out of the pots. Give them a good whack. I'm gonna get off as much of the soil as possible. You'll see lots of little white, uh, adventitious sort of shoots coming through. You wanna get as much of this soil off as possible. Now we'll just clear the deck a little bit so the dog can see the proverbial rabbit. Now you can see these little stems, you just break these down. And each of these, you can see, has got a little white shoot on it. Now, from a nurseryman's point of view, you could pot each of these pieces up um, as, as small as you want to go. Really with a lot of the wood anemones you, you tend to propagate them over a period of two years. Now you can buy these commercially. These obviously are stock plants that we've grown ourselves at Eggleston. I'm not so bothered now because they belong to Lisa and Thomas so that makes no odds to me. But I would be taking them down and growing as many as possible. They, the first year they tend to put down roots and grow, and the second year you get a nice flowering plant. We would grow them in a, a seven centimetre pot. I just need to get one of those. Now, Come over to this bench. This is a little seven centimetre pot. Now, if we fill that up to about a centimetre from the top, half inch, if you uh, are an old bugger, and then just lay them across the top. Horizontally, I'm only going to put one piece in these because I think they need to bulk them up a bit, um, and we'll put some back in, um, back in the original pots. Um, we'll put several back in just to grow on as stock plants for the future, and then just cover them over. There's nothing difficult about it. Some people say they look like boot laces. I always think they look like what we used to get as a kid called stuff called sweet tobacco. I don't think you, can, you probably wouldn't get it anymore. It, it, you know, it will probably encourages children to smoke. Although you can't smoke it because I tried and it don't work. 
So there, it's just a question of how many you want. You can just get a knife and just put that in there and just twist it and you'll find that they prise away really quite quite easily. If you find that they're quite long, like this one, let's find one, you know, you can just run a knife through them. You, know, you see there's some there and some there. Well, if, if you were really hard up, you would just chop them up. There's nothing like, like this. There, there's nothing technical about it at all. It's just a form of division, but you're using these little sort of rhizomous type roots. And that's Vestal. Robinsoniana is slower to bulk up. And it's it's quite a lot rarer. So you tend not to get as as much. But again, you know these these have been in here a few years, so they're doing quite well. Again, you can see all these lovely little shoots. Now that's far too much when you're trying to bulk them up. So I'm just going to run the knife through that. And that will give us a nice, nice little plant. I could even go further with this one. There. Now that one little shoot. That should give us four plants on that. So it's a, it's a slow process because you really need to let them grow in for the first year. Don't be tempted to um, plant them out or sell them in the first spring because they're they're not bound together that they're, they're not all nicely rooted like this you can see how this is formed a nice dense cluster give them the first year and sell them second spring that's it Bob jungle Amazing to think, mid-November and the snowdrops are coming through. You can see there they are. There's bloody hundreds and thousands of them in this garden. <laughs> Viewers will know how much I like snowdrops. I suppose if you haven't got any, they're like really nice little. I'm going to say it, <laughs> heralds of spring. <laughs> I'm going to have to go and punch myself now for saying that. Yeah, they're all just coming through. It is incredibly mild. I think last night is what, the 12th of November and it's 16 degrees at night. Unbelievable, really. Now, one of the things I did want to show you, and we must have a look at it, is the... Uh, Rose, uh, geranium, moisey eye. It's another little area to clear up down there, but you can see here, look at that. Aren't they beautiful? These lovely red bottle shaped hips. They're absolutely gorgeous. Just wonderful. It's uh, uh, Rosa moisei geranium. I'll show you how to do some hardwood cuttings of that next time round, I think. I might even get it in this time. No, I won't. But um, I, I, we will do. We'll do some easy cuttings of those. It's not hard. This is uh, Cotinus, the smoke bush. It's autumn colour. You know, the, the flowers and the purple foliage in the summer are really lovely. And the inflorescences, that's just a poncy way of saying flowers. Uh, they're quite interesting as well. They, it hasn't done it yet. It's not old enough to do that, but it will do soon. But the autumn colour is often overlooked. It is a beautiful thing. 
this area here, I had some vegetables in this year. They were very successful, but it's going to be put down as grass to join up the pond to the sort of main grass lawn area. I can't really call it a lawn, it's a wide path really. So yeah, we'll join it up from here down to a yard or so, you know, a meter, four foot in front of the pond. That, but we'll do that in the spring. I, I'm not a great turfer. I, I, I don't like turfing. I like to get the ground nice and level and sow seed. I just like the, the seed. I just find it easier. Uh, Asa Katsura, not noted for its autumn colour, but it's still very, very nice. Uh, it's really a spring maple. And of course there is the lovely red pygmy the foliage of which is linear, uh, long and thin. You know, the posh way of saying long and thin. Yeah, yeah, red pygmy. I, uh, there's one at Eggleston that many years ago just got out of hand. I don't know what I call the bugger pygmy because it's a big bastard. Uh, but but it's, uh, I cloud pruned it and it was actually really quite effective. It's very, very warm. I keep saying that, I keep going on about that. But it is, when you've worked outside all these years, and I've, you know, it's right from childhood, you notice how the seasons have really changed. Um, it's just very, very strange. Whether it's a natural cycle or not, I don't know. I'll let the boffins decide on that. There's a little maple there, I think it's, uh, Calipes or something. I'd have to ask Thomas. Um, he would know what that was. That's done quite well. It's actually been really stunted over the years. It was a crappy little thing that I put to one side many years ago, and it's about 10 years old, and it has hardly grown at all. You can see at the bottom, it, it, it got stood on, it got sat on, and, it, and it's still clinging to life. So I've given it a chance and planted it out. Um, second Sugi, the cryptomeria, that's doing quite well for its its first year in. It's uh, it's nice. The ones at Eggleston, if, if I can put them on, I will. They've been, I think Thomas and I planted them some years ago, and they're really doing well. It's an amazing thing. That's a uh, red column, I think, as uh, a fastigiate beach probably way too close to everything else but never mind we'll see what happens yeah lovely lovely afternoon put some hollies in along here and, and they're doing well this is uh hansworth new silver i don't need to look at the label for that because uh I can tell by the length of the leaf. There's another one called Silver Queen or, um, oh dear, what is it, Argentia Marginata. They get mixed up over the years. One's male, one's female. But, you know, we've got them from other places when we run out at Eggleston and they're supposed to be the male and they've ended up having berries on. The only way to truly get it right is to know your plant provenance and, and propagate your own because they're so similar, those two. Uh, this, is, uh, this is getting away. This is um, Rubicolis aurea. Much more rounded variegated foliage and golden variegation. Again, it's a female. That there is Edgehog House. He's in there now. I nearly fell ass over it there. He's hibernating in there at the moment. He's, uh, he's pulled all the leaves in behind him. And uh, I just leave him alone. Well, uh, Lisa feeds the hedgehogs and uh, we have six or seven of them out there every evening up on the patio there. Yeah, green little bastards. She feeds them kit kitten biscuits. Yeah, this is Amber. Again, it's in its first year. A year or two and it should get away nicely and fill out. I haven't got a clue what rose this is. It's a little dwarf rose. 
Um, it was Lisa's. She might remember what it is. It might be called the fairy or something. I have to ask her and caption it. But this thing has been in flower all summer. I mean, I'm not a great rose person, but look at it. It's it's really pretty little thing. Absolutely delightful. It's never been without flower. Look at look, look at the buds on the little fucker. It's, it just goes on and on. That's a spinosa. That's the Dunwich rose. That's really good. What I'd probably do with that is prune out some of the old stems just to let it sharpen up. There's some real thorns. Whoa, look at them. Brutes. If you don't like your neighbours, this is the sort of rose you want to uh, have as a hedge on. Look at it. Whoa. I like my neighbours, so it doesn't matter. So it's not planted near the edge. Oh, that's it. People ask me, um, well, several people have asked me how... Whoops. I don't know what that is. Uh, how the boat's coming on. One of the things I do do is I've been working for some years on a model of the uh, HMS Victory. It's made of these little bits of wood and I have the old Admiralty plans. One of the things I have to do is I have to make the, the masts. I haven't got to that point yet. And people don't realize that masts are made of several pieces of wood. But this is the boat so far. I've been on it two or three years. Uh, I'm not getting very far. I've been working on the bows of late. That's the sort of front of the ship. Um, uh, some of it's very, very long-winded. It's, it's double hull, hulled, which means it has inner planks and outer planks. It'll be about five foot long when it's finished. But it just takes such a, a long time, but it's something nice to do. But I do get a bit bored of some of the monotonous things. Each of these portholes has to have a, a, a cover on it, a, a shutter, uh, a door if you like. And the first half a dozen is okay, but I have to do 104 and each one takes me a couple of hours to do. Um, and then the rigging will take a year or so. It's, it's quite long and difficult, but it's coming on all right. It's, uh, it's not everybody's thing, but I, I actually find it quite relaxing. Um, it's copper bottomed. So on top of the uh, two lots of planking, it, the, the bottom of the hull is copper plated. And these are individual little copper planks. I think there's just over a thousand or a thousand and a half on there. Yeah, it's coming on well. There's so much more to do. And um, yeah, we all have our little peccadillos, don't we? <laughs> no. This is a nice thing. This is a burr. Uh, my father-in-law, John Hutchinson, he uh, gave me this um, to, to turn it into something. So we'll have to see what we can do. It's very nice. We don't know what tree it is. Now, John used to make walking sticks and, you know, crooks, things for um, shepherds and um, thumb sticks, that sort of thing. And he used to use these for the handles, you know, cut them down and shape them up and sand them and do that. Well, I'll turn it on a lathe and uh, have a little look, see what we can do with it. I'll show you later in the video. I'm not going to film you, film the turning because there's loads of videos out there and, and I'm not a very professional turner. I've only really got into it properly in later years. Um, but uh, I'll show you what we can do with it. 
this is um this is quite an exciting time this, uh, these i've ordered myself some rhododendrons rhododendrons sorry um <laughs> many years ago lisa and i went up to um to scotland and uh we saw um, a lot of... We went to Thrive, which is like the headquarters of the National Trust. And there were some really interesting um, roadies in their gardens. Uh, ones I hadn't seen before. I've never been a big rhododendron fan. But some of them, the foliage was so fascinating. Anyway, in this country, the primary source of... Uh, well, the best source of interest in... Um, rhododendrons is Glen Doik up in Perth, up near Perth. So they had a collection of the 10, uh, 10 really good, um, interesting foliage rhododendrons. And I'm just unpacking them now. And I mean, look at the colour on the back of that leaf. I mean, yeah, it's the back of the leaf because it's tied up. Very, it's very rare that you see bare-rooted plants these days. Most plants are container-grown, but these are bare-rooted. I, I like that. It's a, it's a traditional old way of um, growing things. But it's quite fascinating going through these. They've come packed in this box. Again, it's a, a very old-fashioned way of doing things look at that look that's really really interesting i have absolutely no idea where i'm going to put these buggers they'll probably just have to go in pots for a few years because I, 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 my ground is only sort of neutral and I, but and they do really well with me in pots it was a collection of 10 rhododendrons look that one's gold on the back. I'm looking forward to getting them open. I mean, I, I, they are fantastic plants. I believe it was about 150, 160 pounds for the collection, which might seem like a lot of money, but these plants are really high quality. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not on the payroll of Glen Doik, but I don't think I would want to go anywhere else for, for roadies. Yeah, uh, as a retired nurseryman, I am really, really impressed. Fantastic. There's a nice maple. That's, especially against this golden Philadelphia here at Eggleston, that's uh, Shindisoja. All right, beauty. Just have a little look over here. And other maples, there's Bloodgood. Uh, what's that one now? Skeeter's Broom. And this isn't a maple, but this is uh, Cedrus Diodora. Roman Candle. You've seen it before, but it's, uh, it's just lovely. The new growth is this beautiful white color. And it does look like the sparks on a Roman candle. Although I'm not sure if you can still get Roman candles these days. Probably can. Dogs are after a rabbit. Well, second one. The first one was dispatched quite quickly. It's what they live for. If you have a nursery, Jack Russells are the perfect dog. They don't do too much damage. And they save you a fortune in stock damage. Just general rabbit. And of course, rat problems, if ever you get rats. They're strange dogs. I, I couldn't be without them, but they are... Um, you know why she does that she's disguising herself she likes to roll in bird shit I know it's disgusting and then she sleeps on my bed 
Oh, Finn's having a bit of a sniff, eh? Yeah, you're too much of a lady, aren't you, Finn? You're not, you're a scumbag. Where's the other one? Tucker? No. Oh. He's probably caught the rabbit. He enjoys the liver, but without the Chianti. It's the most incredible freestanding, not against a wall, freestanding Cyanophis. He stands about eight foot tall by uh, 10 foot wide. It is incredible. And the Benny Fuji is absolutely magnificent. I mean, look at that. I don't think I've ever seen it as good. It must be because I'm not here anymore. Well, you might remember, it was either in the last episode or the one before, um, the barbarism that Thomas and I were using on the penstemons. These are them now. Now we cut them right back. If you look at those, they are looking healthy, vibrant, verdant. How's that for poshness? And uh, altogether excellent plants. They're in nice big five litre pots and they are gonna flower for much of um, summer. Look at that. You couldn't get a better plant than that. There we go. Look at that. What's this one? Eleanor Young. Dark crimson. Beautiful thing. Five litres, 12.95. You wouldn't be able to complain at that. Sometimes you have to cut things back or prune them. Not, you don't have to do it to everything. People think, oh, I've got a plant, I must prune it. You don't, you just need to know what you're pruning. And the old saying used to be, better to prune too much than too little. And there's a degree of truth in that. Here's one of my very favorite flowers. This is an aconite. It's an aconitum bicolor. And the flower is beautiful. It's a, it's a bicolor, obviously, as the name suggests. The only problem with it is it's an extremely weak growing plant, which is really, really irritating because it's lovely. Um, not something, uh, it's, uh, the aconites are poisonous, monk's hoods. So you probably wouldn't have it if you've got children that eat plants in the garden or are likely to. Here's a little green echinacea. I think it's probably green twister. I, I, I'm not sure if green twister's got a little bit more pink in it than this one. It might be green envy or something like that. Nice plant. Again, it's only just been planted so I, I've, I can't remember what the seed was called but it's uh, uh, it's, it's a nice thing. Again, it will be a much better plant next year. All of these borders will be good next year. Now this is an allium, a very late flowering allium. Uh, oh, it's, it's, it's been redder. It's, it, uh, it's called red mohican. I, I, I don't know why it's called red mohican. It's red. That's about it. I got the um, bulbs from Parker's. Yeah, no, 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 no disrespect to Parker's, but it's on about a four or five foot stem. It's fucking horrible. I, I really don't know why. I, I think I expected it to be something different. Now, what other failures have we got? Now my Regersia, it's not thriving. Look at that, I put that in there in such high hopes. It's obviously just too dry for it there. It, it, it's done it there in the past, but 
I thought it was maybe a, a weak plant, but it's not. So there is a failure. The Brunnera, I think this is uh, Heart of the Sea or Sea Heart or something. I don't know, a lot of them look very similar. Again, that's doing quite well. It likes this sort of like dry area. And in summer, this, this wall side does get a little bit dry. I need to get in here and weed again. Yeah, this is the Sanguisorba. It's uh, suffered in the, in the wind. Um, it's something I bought from another nursery. We were out, oh, I don't know, about a month ago. So it's just been bunged in there. Again, I'm looking forward to it next year. It's a lovely thing. I've always grown them and had them. This one has particularly long dangly bits. I'd like to know the feeling. Now this is one of my favorite plants. Years ago, the Shasta Daisy used to be called Chrysanthemum Maxima. Now, see if I can get this one. It's maybe a little bit too sunny. Uh, now it's called Leucanthemum. Um, this is Leucanthemum. Um, this is an old variety called Esther Reed. It's not a complete double. Some of the doubles can look a bit blousy looking. But this one, it's been around a, a good many years. It's a lovely sunshiny semi-double. Yeah. I like it. It's a, it's a really nice plant. It's not vulgar and it's not uh, singularly boring as some of them are. Uh, it, yeah, really good. The other plant that's worth note is the um, Sussex Beauty, the uh, Sidalsia. This is about three or four foot high. Absolute cracking plant. Now, I'm not sure if that's the seedling of Sussex Beauty or the actual clone of it. So I'll have to check and redo it. Well, this is a bit strange. This uh, isn't the natural color of the pond. I've just added a blanket weed treatment, something by Cloverleaf and uh, it's supposed to get rid of the, the blanket weed. And there's not a mass in here, but it's probably best to keep on top of it. There, look at that. It's quite, uh, quite something really, isn't it? was pretty clear before now it's sort of like uh oh. I had an aunt who used to make a soup and it used to look like this I don't know if it was pea soup I can't remember what it was but she used to make it honest to god it was bloody horrible anyway that's not of any relevance. We will see how this goes. There's, um, I'm gonna circulate the blade in a minute and try and, and pump it round properly. Um, there's some off and rud in here, not very many, just a few. So I just uh, need to apparently keep the oxygen levels up. So I think the blade will add some oxygen to it. Actually, it's quite a nice color, isn't it really? Avocado. Avocado. <laughs>
So what I was able to do with that bell was make um, a little jewellery box. Um, I don't know if you can see this in the light. It's just a little little box for putting things putting things in. It's uh, turned on the inside. You can't get a, a smooth edge on it. It's what we call a natural finish because parts of the burl fly away. But it's it's the lovely what's the what's the word the lovely grain in it that's really nice. I'm very happy with it. It's uh, uh, something you can just put bits of. I don't know what Lisa's got in here necklace or something but yeah I'm, I'm very happy with that and that's what that little barrel turned in that the little barrel that, that i showed you turned into um yeah, it doesn't take that long three or four hours something like that proper turners can do them much much quicker here is uh, another what we call a natural edged bowl this is um i think this is walnut it, or it could be a, a an elm barrel uh, it's what they call natural edged um, in the fact that you've left some of the bark on it would have the tree itself would have been three or four hundred years old um, the graining is is lovely I, I, you just think how many years that's been growing you know three four centuries this is another one it's just turned out of a log this is a little piece of yew um, it should have been a little bit deeper but I actually broke a piece of it off, and um, but the, the the log itself would have been that way, and it would have been turned um, against the grain, cross grained, I think you call it. Yeah. So so those are the thought sort of things that you can turn on a lathe, and I've been storing up quite a bit of little bits of wood over the years, and obviously I've got access to some bits and pieces, and one or two friends that give me. Uh, bits of old root and odd things that have been growing. <laughs> At my age, one of the problems is you have to dry these things that you can't really dry it, do them green. You can, but then you've got to store them. So <laughs> they say about an inch a year to dry or a year per inch. And uh, yeah, so if something's 12 inches, it's 12 years, by which time I'll be nearly 80. So, but as I say, it's uh, it's not the destination. It's often the journey getting there that's just as exciting. It's a bit like planting trees. You know, you, you may not see the tree in the end, but you can visualize it. And, and, and that's, that's uh, something that gives you joy or pleasure that, that you're leaving something behind on this earth that is worth leaving behind. God, that's philosophical. I, I need to do a good knob joke now. <laughs> oh, I was gonna show you. Uh, you've probably seen it before. This is a Noreen. These are lovely plants. They flower late in the year. And they really are good, sort of against a wall. They don't rot off and dry. Um, so uh, that's, that's quite good. That's a, a Daphne called Jacqueline Postil. Echiums, they're fucking great things. Um, it's still alive. It's about four foot, five foot tall now, and I'm hoping it's gonna flower this year. The rhododendrons I told you about, or if I haven't told you about, I'm about to. <laughs> they are looking well. That's a, a variegated form. There's one there with strange leaves, one with furry leaves. And I'm looking forward to these. You can see the redness of the backs of some of them. And this little bugger, I don't know what it is. It's, uh, what's it called? Ever red. Yeah, the leaves are really dark on that. Now, this is a particularly fine maple. I remember planting this 20 odd years ago. This is uh, a cereu, Acer palmatum cereu. It's the only upright dissectum, and uh, it's a vigorous grower. Now this one, it's been cut back several times, 
and occasionally if you look in here you can see it gets some you can see that some of the larger branches have at times been cut out um, you have to to keep it civilized otherwise it just gets way too big it's a, it's a, it's a lovely lovely maple but you really do need a larger garden to, to, to grow it in now have a look at these berries now these are it's a fantastic year for berries this is uh, uh, Ilex wilsonii really thick leaves and pillar box red berries fluorescence very very rarely berries and yet this year absolutely covered this uh, fluorescence is a very old variety it's been out around about 400 years the fluorescence and the wilsonii need male plants to pollinate them but if you live in a village or somewhere or there's holly trees around or a holly hedge within say quarter or half a mile you should be fine there'll be plenty of pollen this is J.C. Van Toll, um, very similar to Pyramidalis. Again, really heavy on the berries, but Pyramidalis and J.C. Van Toll are unique in that they are self-fertile. They don't need any berries. Talking of Ilex wilsonii, there's been another wilsonii, a Thomas wilsonii, running around the gardens dressed in red, singing bloody songs. I don't know what the place has come to. I, like, I know it has an effect on you, but it's not normal. It's not normal behavior. Running around the garden in a red dress. It's no wonder he's struggling with the girlfriends. Or is he? Yeah. You know, what with being a sheep farmer and all the rest of it, Maybe he's moving on to reindeer. Maybe they kiss better. I don't know. Well, it's a beautiful autumn day and we've been very, very lucky in the garden today because Santa Claus called in to see us and he was in very high spirits. Amazing. Can any of you guess what now. Santa's <laughs> real name is? Ho, ho, ho. These are, these are snowberries, I think. I don't know. I don't remember having these. Um, Arbutus, the snowberry tree. Oh, sorry, not snowberry. Oh, what a tosser. Uh, strawberry tree. And you can see the fruits on it. They don't look like strawberries to me, but there you are. Again. It's fruiting and in flower at the same time. Most peculiar. It's uh, Arbutus unido. Now this is a variety, I, Thomas must have got hold of it. This is a uh, compactor, so it's a, a dwarfer one. The bark on these can be very beautiful. Although it's an evergreen, the bark has a lovely cinnamon color to it. You can see, especially the younger bark, if you can get the camera in there. It's very, very nice and it has a papery edge to it. It's a plant that when planted, it's very much like birch. It's very attractive to toadstools, fungus and that sort of thing. It doesn't do any harm. It's just one of those plants that exudes something that, that, that fungus find really um, interesting with birch you often get the fly agaric, the typical red um, children's fairy tale toadstool. You wouldn't want to eat it because it's quite poisonous. I see it, oh, I've got no more to say on that. I decided to sit for Poetry Corner today down by the stream because of this beautiful maple tree that's just turning its colours, it's gorgeous, there's quite a few 
that have fallen underneath but it's just beautiful and the sound of the water is lovely I'm sitting on a very damp wooden bridge so I'll probably regret this but um, today's poem is called The Peace of Wild Things and it's written by somebody called Wendell Berry who is um, an American poet 20th and 21st century still writing from Kentucky I believe it's the best name ever, isn't it, Wendell Berry? It makes me think Wendell Berry, like, like something you might make a pie from. Oh, you know, would you like a slice of Wendell Berry pie? Um, I mean, with ice cream, obviously. But uh, yeah, it's just like a, a really brilliant name for someone who writes a lot of natural poetry. I hope you like it. When despair for the world grows in me and I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world and am free. No, you're looking very well, actually. What have you got yeah. written across your bosoms? Um, I've had a trip to Paris and recently, and um, I bought it there. It says "Ooh la la," which is French. Is it? Oh, well, what almost. does it mean? It just means "Ooh you la don't la." Know, do you? you don't know what it means. <laughs> it means what it says. It means "Ooh la." It's what the can can girls do, isn't it? When they lift up their drawers. I don't. I wouldn't know about that, Malcolm. I've That's got a question. Too for cold you. up here. Go I, ahead. I have a question for you. Crap on. Quite Does Phil wear pants? Um, what, wait, any pants or are we being specific? No, I'm being specific. I'll tell you why. Because, okay. like, in America, if you're wearing pants, they mean trousers. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why do they call? We, uh, uh, when somebody says pants to me, yeah. I think of, like, pants, knickers, 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 drawers. What do they call knickers, then? I don't know what they call them. No, maybe, yeah, maybe one of them will that. write in, because we have some... If yes. anybody out there can tell me why you call trousers pants, I'd very much like to know. Also, you might want to check on Fanny. Yeah, Fanny. <laughs> fa what? There's no need to get smutty. Fanny. Apologies. Now, why do you call Fanny 
Because like for, for us, that means like lady bits, doesn't it? Yeah, it really does. And once when I was out there and I got attacked by a mosquito, um, the pharmacist asked me if it had bitten me on the fanny. I was quite, because I was sitting in, oh, we were in this camping place. That threw me completely because no pharmacist in Britain would ever ask you that. No. No, it no. just wouldn't happen, would it? No, it, yeah. No. They'd lose their license. It'd need to be a lot bigger than a mosquito. <laughs> So, yeah, they, they are different from there's, us, though. There's strange things in our language. You don't like anything woke, do you, Mark? No, I don't like it. He doesn't do woke. woke. It gets on my tit ends. Yes, <laughs> yes. And another thing. Oh, God, now, you're another posh. thing. <laughs> you're posh, aren't you? You're sort of uh, middle class. Well, we've had this conversation before, haven't we? And no. I'm only posh compared to you, welcome. <laughs> I you. mean, I don't class as posh anywhere else, but here... Yeah. Being middle class. Yeah. Now, do you say constable or constable oh ox that one i say constable yeah as in the painter constable, well, John constable. That, yeah but you can't be that posh because when they when posh people say it they say constable right right you've been reading the dictionary rude. haven't you malcolm <laughs> and it's always bad news when you do that no no it doesn't i've 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 noticed that they do that when they're referring to like a police constable but yeah. I, I avoid that issue by saying constable how do you say it lisa you said, feel free to ignore this conversation. She's ignoring it. And she's looking the other way. I don't blame her. It was, it was very good of her to hold a camera and let you out of the house, let alone anything else. But um, is these the Have only Have you got another holiday plan? Because you're um, always on holiday. No, I'm not. We are going back to America in um, April, I think, next year. Again? Yes, yes. They'll let you in again. Really. They'll let me in. Well, at the moment they will. It seems um, politically more open. We'll see what happens. <laughs> but but yeah. like funny. <laughs> oh, oh, Lisa, can you do nothing? Nothing. Is it beyond hope? Just have a little think. But I, I'm sorry, because you've clearly done what you could do. You brought it up. I, 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 <laughs> yeah, did I, actually? <laughs> Is he done with me I'm now? I'm warming my bottom now on the fire. I was talking the other day, Malcolm. Once you stood there for so long, do you remember your trousers nearly caught fire? Yeah. And you suddenly yelped, because yeah. they, they got hot they on the outside. Have you ever that? <laughs> stood by the fire, and your trousers get hot, and then when they touch your skin. Your pants get hot, and you're warming your fanny. What's that thing? <laughs> yeah, yeah, what's that thing? Something about pants on fire. Liar, liar, pants on fire. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, if the cap fits. <laughs> <laughs>